All right, guys, so welcome to How Soon Is It to Have Sex? Um, we're here with Dr. Maureen Whalahan, and I'm, my name is Tammy. I'm one of your connection guys at Single Life Today. And I'm just going to read a little bit about Dr. Whalahan because her background is extensive and amazing, and I don't want to miss a thing, but she is a board certified OBGYN. She is practicing in Palm Beach County. That's how I met her. She graduated Alpha Omega Alpha from the University of South Florida College of Medicine and completed her residency at the University of Florida Shands Jacksonville. She practices in West Palm Beach. She's a founding partner in the Center for Sexual Health and Education. She's most recently um, owner, um, and she just opened, I'm sorry, the Center for Modern Medicine in Boynton Beach, where she certifies patients for medical cannabis. So we have that to look forward to in the future. <laughs> She's past president of Palm Beach County Medical Society and the past president of the Florida OBGYN Society. She's done a series of XM Radio um, 160 called Sexual Medicine and Health and made regular monthly appearances for five years on NBC's Charlotte Today Show and Blog Talk Radio. We're super lucky to have her here. She's a volunteer physician for the Project Access Program in Palm Beach County. And in 2012, she received the Women in Leadership Award from the Executive Women of the Palm Beaches. In 03, she was honored by the Leukemia and Lymphoma Society and Palm Beach Illustrated as Woman of the Year. And in 2009, nominated by the Lupus Foundation as one of the best and brightest women in Palm Beach County. She is also the author of Kiss and Tell, Secrets of Sexual Desire from Women 15 to 97. And I am super excited to have her here with us for the very first time uh, to tell us all the things that we are wanting to know, but we might not feel comfortable to ask, or maybe we haven't had a chance to, to ask. We haven't had an authority like Dr. Whalahan in our midst before. So I'm um, very excited uh, to, to introduce you, Dr. Whelahan. Thanks for joining us today. Um, and a thrill to know you personally as well. Thanks. Well, thanks for spending your Saturday midday or early morning in the case of EJ. Uh, I, I said to uh, Tammy, this is, there's only one thing I like about Zoom interaction, and that is that uh, I could just get off the boat. So we were out fishing this morning, uh, out trolling, in the ocean for trying to get some mahi and tuna came out came back empty-handed so no catching just fishing uh since about uh seven o'clock this morning so we just pulled into the dock and i ran in thus uh my attire uh, but i have to tell you what what got me interested in sexual medicine was first uh just an inherent interest as an individual i it was not anything i was ever shy about but when i stopped delivering babies um and my demographic in my practice changed and it really skewed towards women 40 and over and the complaints were very different. These were women in long-term marriages that were pissed off at their spouses most of the time and just didn't want to get naked. Even if they liked sex, they were convinced they didn't anymore. Uh, so they were punishing themselves and punishing their spouse. And, um, and then this other group of women over 40 who were single and not getting enough sex and hungry. And, um, and so it was really about having a conversation of how to find the satisfaction that you're looking for and, and being happy because intimacy is a critical part of, of a long-term relationship. And, and to ignore that, unless you're mutually ignoring it, uh, to ignore that uh, you're suppressing something that perhaps you, you just uh, 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 don't know what you're doing. You, you just you've gotten you've gotten used to your behavior. Uh, but I have to tell you, as I was reading over the logo of the website uh, for what um, BJ just called STI, I read a quote on Tammy's page that says 61% claim their vacation with STI was life changing. And I said, holy smokes, these people are getting sexually transmitted infections on their vacation. Yes, that is gonna be life changing. So of course, looking at a different perspective, STI to me meant sexually transmitted infection. And I imagine if you got one of those on vacation, you would be really pissed off. 
Uh, so part of my conversation today will be to help you perhaps not have that happen to you as you uh, jump into a new relationship and, and how exactly uh, do you stay safe and how do you have those conversations about preventing uh, infection and disease. So, uh, so in this conversation of how soon is too soon, uh, you know, Brad sort of said, hey, as soon as possible. And uh, I think that he really speaks well for the majority, probably 80% of men who uh, are hungry all the time. It is on, they're turned on. And about 20% of women are actually like that too. Um, so what drives that? Probably testosterone. So there are women who are a little bit more testosterone driven and therefore they have a lot of focus on sex. And we can usually identify those women in a crowd based on their behavior, especially with the men. Uh, and the men don't really uh, see anything wrong with that because that's what they're thinking about too. And then 20% of men uh, really are estrogen dominant. They, they, they seem to uh, need a little bit more cuddling and closeness and, and nice talk. Uh, and about 80% of women require that. And then there's this whole host of other stuff that, that messes up uh, a, a good evening. And I think it happens more in that 80% of women and 20% of men um, when, when it starts. So trying to compartmentalize sex and, and sexual intimacy and orgasm and, and fulfillment uh, would be the goal, but it's so hard to teach someone how to do that or, or how to learn that. Um, but I think in the very beginning of a relationship, so you've met somebody online or on a vacation and you're really excited, you know, sometimes you can look across the room and feel that tingling and excitement and just go, oh my God, I have walked into rooms before for with people that I don't know and just get a a feeling about someone that is across the room that, you know, and, you know, I'm always trying to interpret that and say, well, what is that? And, you know, animals have something called pheromones and maybe humans do too. We believe that they do. Uh, and so that's that chemistry. Beware of that uh, because that excitement is probably not real and, uh, and so I'm going to give you a general timeline of how to negotiate how you're feeling and, and, and where's reality and where's love and, and dopamine. So the driver of all that excitement is dopamine. Uh, if I could package dopamine or figure a way to safely trigger your dopamine by a drug, there are drugs that do that, right? Parkinson's medications trigger dopamine. So Patients whose spouses have take Parkinson's meds, they do some pretty sexually inappropriate things sometimes, uh, and, and that may be good or not good in the relationship. Um, but they have side effects. So if I could package it, it, it would be, how do we all get more dopamine when we want? And some of the newer products out to enhance women's desire is really trying to trigger norepinephrine and dopamine to two sexy chemicals or neurotransmitters in our brain. So dopamine is the troublemaker and that's the thing that makes you um, drive by somebody's house and see if they're there or see if somebody else is there. Um, it's the one that makes you drunk dial when you've broken up and you, you're like, oh, I got to you know, and then next day you probably <laughs> think twice about that. Um, but that's dopamine that's driving that. So for the first six months of your new encounter, it's really all dopamine and that's lust. And it feels great. There's nothing better. If we could just live like that. Um, I have women in my practice that are single and, you know, I ask every time, you know, cause I write down in their GYN visit, oh, she's got a new guy. And then the next time I'm like, how's your new guy? Oh no, he's gone. And I'm, you know, so what happened? And, you know, sometimes women will recognize, I think I'm just a serial dater. Uh, and what that really means to me is that you are addicted to that lust, that, that dopamine surge. And the minute that dies down, which is about six months, uh, you sort of give up or you're dissatisfied. 
Uh, and so we always have that conversation. From six months to a year, year and a half, um, the dopamine is starting to trickle down to more normal levels. Uh, and that's called passionate love. And passionate love says you're really still very turned on by the person you've met, um, but you can actually get some regular work done. You can focus on work and all the projects and your family and the shit that you're supposed to be doing and not just completely wound up in this person that you've been lusting after for six months. So that goes on until a year, year and a half. And then you start seeing all the details of your mate that you maybe don't like. Like, you know, they leave the lights on all the time or they throw their dirty laundry on the floor next to the hamper. They don't seem to make it to the hamper or they've made themselves a sandwich and leave the dirty knife and the paper plate out on the counter like the freaking housekeeper is coming by to pick that up. Um, and so you become more critical. When those behaviors were there all along, but you were so involved with dopamine that you ignored. So by two years, if you make it that long in a relationship, that's a reasonable time to make a commitment. That's called uh, uh, companion love. And that's where you're, you, you could probably make the long run. So when people are telling me they're gonna get married after six months, I'm like, no, don't do it. You know, there's something you haven't seen yet. Um, and so, uh, you know, so those are, so one of my first conversations when people are dating is don't, don't commit to moving in together or, um, or marrying uh, before you really know the partner, unless you're really sure, but it'd be hard to be sure with all that dopamine. The second is, okay, so now you've met somebody that turns you on, whether it's going to be a long-term lover or not, you want to get laid. Uh, and um, that goes both ways. Women are just as horny as men. They're just conditioned or, or taught from a very young age not to express that because it's unladylike. And so they have this idea that they have to behave a certain way um, so that the men will respect them or like them. I think it's all a crock of shit, but the fact is that there are people that really behave that way and um, it's not fair, uh, but that's human nature. I was giving a lecture to medical doctors of all ages, uh, but mostly they're young. They were residents, uh, a couple attendings. Um, and you know, I give them a sex talk often and they enjoy it and they ask appropriate questions, but we had a conversation about, okay, so you're out on a date and you know, the majority of these people were men, and but there were women in the audience. And I said, and you find somebody is such a turn on that you're, you're and you're horny, you haven't had it in a long time, so you just give it up and because you're you're going to take it. Um, I was shocked that these intellectual men who understand anatomy and neurotransmitters and and relationships said to me out loud that well. But if she does me on that night, I'm not going to call her back. I said, wait a minute. You have just had mind-blowing sex. Uh, you're turned on. She seems like the perfect girl for you. And you're not going to call her back because she, you were kissing her and it got her turned on. And so she, get, got, you know, she gave it up. And, and, and I said, why would you say that? And, and the answer was, well, if she gave it up that quickly for me, she probably does that for, to everyone else. Uh, and so it's a wonder why women get trapped into this behavior of game playing about do they want it, don't they want it, how long do you wait? Um, so the answer seems to be, so I asked these very guys, okay, so what's the right number? And it's the third time, the third date. I'm like, well, can that be like breakfast, lunch, and then hit it at dinner? Uh, no, I don't, I don't think that really went. But um, so, um, so, you know, the, the idea was that you have to figure out um, who you're partnering with and what, what are you in it for? If you're in it because you want to have fun right now, life could be over tomorrow with COVID. So I'm just going to go out and enjoy my life to the fullest. And if I want to get sex, I'm going to have it. And I don't give a crap if it doesn't turn out well then it doesn't turn out and um, I'll move on. 
Um, or am I trying to keep this person as my next spouse uh, or long-term lover? Uh, maybe I need to wait till the third date. So while I think it's not fair that people judge in such a way, um, it seems to be the norm amongst folks uh, of all ages and, and intellectual levels, which makes absolutely no sense to me. Um, so what do you have to think about? All right, so this is probably the biggest bit of advice that I give to my women. So it seems like most people say, well, I'll use a condom um, for my first couple sexes. Uh, you know, well, when you get over 50, a condom could be an absolute boner killer. So I don't know that relying on a condom, while it's very effective for its function of preventing STIs and STDs, um, um, it, it really impairs men uh, as they get older. And uh, it could be a real challenge in a new relationship because then there's performance anxiety and it, it, this whole cascade of symptoms begins to occur all because of this fear of putting a sheath of latex, which takes away sensation and uh, so, and not to mention how nervous you are about uh, your date. Um, so my remedy for that is um, that I tell the girl, I test the girl and I give her a prescription for her lover. Sometimes I give them four prescriptions without names on them and without dates of the same order and say, okay, fill in his name and the date and have him go to the lab and and then call me, you know, a week after you've sent him to the lab and I'll have everything or four days, whatever. Um, and that way I've tested the patient and her partner for HIV, syphilis, herpes, and gonorrhea and chlamydia. So by far, chlamydia is what we see, but the thing that really frustrates people to no end is uh, uh, herpes, genital herpes. And genital herpes is common. 20% of all people ages 12 and over have genital herpes. So it's not a scarlet H, but you have to know how to manage it if you have it and, and how to have the conversation or avoid the conversation. And I'll tell you reasons why it would be okay to do it either way. But the worst thing to do is think you understand your condition and not understand your condition and um, transmit it to your lover uh, uh, unknowingly. Uh, so when women come in with a, a, a new primary herpes outbreak and they've just met somebody in the last six months, my first comment is always, no one intentionally transmits herpes to their lover. Either they don't know it or they don't understand how it's transmitted. Um, and so be, be aware that um, genital herpes is transmitted usually when there is no outbreak there. So while an individual only has an outbreak one to three times a year, um, they can shed virus two weeks before that, one week after that, and sometimes randomly in between outbreaks, and they just don't know it. Uh, and so to the susceptible host uh, partner, uh, they get the infection and, you know, it's like a pregnant cat. It's a gift, gift that keeps on giving. Um, and there's ways to manage it. So uh, if I have a patient who has a history of genital herpes, my recommendation is Valtrex 500 milligrams, Valley Cyclovir 500 milligrams every day, period. You will reduce your transmission rate to your lover by 90%. That's the best I have for you. A condom is 20% because the condom doesn't cover the majority of the skin in the genitalia where the lesions can reside. Um, and so, um, so understanding the disease and, and taking suppression. If you tested your partner, uh, then you would know whether they've ever had it before. And if they have, then neither of you need to take anything. So if you both have it, then no one needs to take suppression because you're not at risk for each other. Um, and you can't re-give it to somebody. If uh, neither of you have it, great. So just hope that neither of you hook up with someone else and bring it into the relationship. Uh, so, so that would be my one thing that I discuss a lot is genital herpes because it's just 
the most frustrating thing emotionally in a couple because nobody really knew and no doctor ever told them about the risk. So, uh, and then um, the, the final comment on when, on sex, before I open up the floor to your questions is body image and performance. So, you know, everybody believes they need to be a porn star um, when they're having sex because a, there's a lot of pornography out there. And so women believe they need to look like a porn star, which, you know, most of those porn stars are like 18. Although I have a couple older porn stars, prior porn stars in my GYN practice. And uh, they've gone from being the, the star of the show to being the producer. And, you know, now they're in their 60s. So it always cracks me up. Because, uh, you know, I try and envision them in their uh, role when they were younger. Um, but they're usually very open and just like they're on set when they're having a conversation with me, which always cracks me up. Um, but suffice it to say that body image for everyone, men and women, men worry just about as much about their body and the look of their body and the function as women. Uh, and so, and then the performance anxiety. So if you haven't gotten laid in a long time, and now, and especially if you've been watching porn to masturbate to, and now you've got a woman who you're going to engage with or any partner, um, sometimes it's the arousal is just not the same as on the video. And so your ability to get a, an appropriate erection uh, just doesn't show up when it's supposed to. And it can be just devastating to the male partner. And these are the conversations I have with women when they are dating. And I always ask, you know, how old is your lover going to be? You know, what, what age group are you looking at? Um, and then I say, remember, this is a worry uh, amongst men. And here's how you're going to deal with this. And, you know, I usually say, if, if it isn't, if there's not a, 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 an appropriate erection happening when you wanted it to, go to something else. Do something else fun. There's a million ways to have pleasure uh, with a mate, and it doesn't have to be all penetration focused. It'll happen uh, because, after all, we've got Viagra and Cialis. Viagra is generic, so you can get like, you know, I don't know, 30 tablets for whatever, $10 copay these days. Uh, but anyway, um, so. So learning how to quickly change over to the next fun thing to do and not focus on what's not working tonight. Uh, so those are sort of the things that I talk to my patients about um, as they're, in, you know, getting into a new relationship and really excited about meeting things. And then if there's the only bad thing that you shouldn't do is to assume that you regardless of your vast lovemaking experience, do not assume that you know how the next person works. Listen to the cues given from your lover. If they say, I need a handheld vibrator on my clitoris while you're penetrating me to have the best orgasm, cool. How can I help you find the best vibrator to work with us? Not, well, none of the other women I've ever been with needed that. Um, anytime w one person or the other criticizes the other's sexual thoughts, or even if it didn't mean to be a criticism, if it's like, you want to tie me up and do what? You know, the tone. So the tone should always be, oh, that's interesting, especially if it's something, so I have a couple who, um, he almost died in, when she was telling me this uh, while he was sitting on the couch with her, but I couldn't figure out what, why she wasn't having sex with him. He, he looked and sounded like he was doing all the right things, except he forgot to tell me a couple things. And that is that he liked to chase her around before as a prelude to sex. And I said, what happens when he catches you? And she said, he tickles me. I said, Okay, is that bad? And she said, my father used to chase us when we were children and beat us. So by the time he would catch me, I was already in fear of my life that I was getting a beating. And I'm like, oh, well, obviously he can't chase you anymore. And I looked at her guy and I said, you, you can't chase her. Um, 
And so I said, anything else? And she says, well, yes. Then um, he wants me to spank him uh, and, and, you know, beat him uh, on the butt, you know, with a paddle. And I said, and he was like slithering down the couch, like, oh dear, I can't believe she just said that. So I was looking at her and I said, oh, well, do you know why he does that or why he likes that? And she's like, no, I think that's weird. And I was like, well, no, it's actually more common than you think. I said, but he's this powerful CEO that bosses around people all day. He's probably an asshole at work and he fires people. And when he comes home, he feels that when you spank him, you alleviate him from his guilt of his bad behavior. And, um, and that's part of his ability to relax and enjoy sex. And she was listening and she's like, hmm, ah, okay. And so she got it. And I said, is, now that you know what that is, is that okay if you still do that? And she was said, yes. So both people don't have to like the same thing, but have an open mind and be ready to discuss it and never, never compare your new lover with all your other people. Even if you think it's a little bit of an insult, don't take it that way. Take it as she's, you know, they're a nervous wreck about telling you what they want from you for sex. And gosh, by the time you're our age, you should be really able to tell your lover how you want someone to do you. So uh, with those little tips, um, when to know what to do in your relationship, uh, checking for STDs early on, uh, and, um, and then body image and performance, I'm going to sort of open it up and get some comments based on your experience in your relationships that have either been successful or, or not successful, and how we might correct that for the future. All right, open it up, Miss Tammy. I've got everybody with the ability to unmute. So thank you, Dr. Whalahan. I learn so many things from you every time I talk, and it is valuable stuff. It's just valuable fun. It, it's it's so important. So, so so now, probably to most of you, since we all are in the same age group. A lot of this probably is not new information. It may just be a slightly different perspective, but I'm curious, uh, and I'll bet you on the men, it's gonna be a zero. How many of your doctors actually, uh, since they know you're single, ask you if you want annual STD testing? I would imagine it does not get discussed. <laughs> the right mark? Yeah. Really, yeah. you too, VJ? Oh, so. The medical community is just as inhibited as their patients. It is shocking to me. We are gynecologists. We are the master of the vagina and all parts vagina and butt. And yet 14, only 14% 14 of OBGYN speak to their patients about sex, sexual pleasure, pain, orgasm. And, um, and so this audience is no different than what we expect. But is there anything that I said, especially on the guy side, uh, that seemed to be something that you don't think is true? No. Nope. Yeah. Nope. Sort of experience, right? Well, experience, and certainly in my case, uh, because, and Tammy knows this, uh, I'm a photographer. And uh, up until about five years ago, I used to work for a couple of modeling agencies. Oh boy. And I uh, used to do a lot of model portfolios. And for some reason, when you're sitting there shooting, could be you know, 18 year old, could be 34 year old, but you're, you're sitting there all day shooting and they're changing costumes and things like that. Um, my, I have a cousin who's a hairdresser and it's sort of the same thing. Somehow you build this chemistry and you learn about their whole life in that eight, 10 hour day. And uh, you, you know, everything you said is absolutely true. Um, I will say that from just observation, non-scientific, that probably a lot of the models tend to be the women with more testosterone. 
or just confident because they're beautiful, right? So models have been told their whole life uh, how beautiful they are. So they've only been fed positive messaging about their physique, uh, whether they're plus size models or other, they all have a sense of self-confidence that, that reaches beyond the average woman. Yeah. And so, um, so whether it's testosterone in that group or just confidence, but you're right. I, I think what Mark really expresses is that women are hungry. They want to tell, they want to be sexual. They want to be sexy, but they're so pushed into behaving a certain way that only in the privacy of a video shoot or a photo shoot or their hairdresser, um, do they feel as though they can confide those naughty secrets uh, to their partner? Uh, the other part of that too is age. Um, I can't tell you how many horny women are in my practice ages 50 to 80. I have a lot of horny women in their 80s and now the, the, the dating pool is slim, right? Because the men are starting to fall off, you know, or if, they, if they're alive, they can't get a boner. So, um, but yet their, their impression of men is, oh, you know, he only wants girls in their thirties or, or a young one. And I, I don't think that's true. I think men want and would take an age appropriate lover as long as it was a sexy lover. Uh, it, it's just that their experience is usually with their spouse, uh, who was asexual or hated sex or whatever. Um, and so their thought was, it must be she's an old hag, and therefore I need to get some young blood to, to get laid. So, but Mark, you bring up some really good points about women and behavior. I wanted to uh, add something while you guys are thinking, and that is, I hear so often from the travel side, we've never really promoted Singles Travel International, although people have said we should change your name with the SBI, usually if they're, if they're from England. But uh, I, I hear from women all the time, you know, I'm just not interested. And I, somebody actually responded to my invite to this event today and they said, oh, I'm, I'm not interested. And I alluded to um, in my messaging today that Dr. Whalenhan saved my sex life. And that's, uh, and that's true because I don't know, sorry, it's my, um, my audio here. And, you know, listening to her, uh, because over 50, sometimes women experience a lot of pain. And so I don't know if men know that or not. And so I wanted to share that. So um, maybe that's necessarily the remedy, but um, I, I think that some women are not interested because they've experienced pain and they don't know how to get over that and they're not comfortable expressing. That's a really good point. Uh, so statistically, 50% of women who do not have sex in the menopause do not have sex because it hurts. 50%. And, you know, I'm somebody who talks about sex all the time at my office and I'm, you know, 59 years old. And when women say that, and well, how long has this been going on? Because their vagina looks like it's a shriveled up prune. Uh, oh, well, you know, it's been about five years. Well, who, why has no one done anything about this? Well, I just figured it was part of menopause. So it's the reluctance of the patient to bring it up. And then who does she bring it up to? Her friends, who all have a shriveled up puss as well. And so it's misery loves company. They're all feeling the same way. Uh, but, but there's two, two things. One is just simply bringing the vagina back to life with uh, uh, some estrogen, even in breast cancer patients and other cancer patients, we, can, we have remedies that are useful. Coconut oil is awesome. It's fun for both men and women to play with. It's a nice natural source. It's, it's $5.99 for like a Publix vat that will last you for a year. And um, so, so addressing sexual pain, but sexual pain even occurs in young kids. So, so there's a condition uh, between in women that I've seen between ages 20 and 88 that have, it feels like, they tell you, it feels like you're stabbing them when you just enter the opening of the vagina. And um, that's a completely different condition that doesn't even have to be a dry vagina. It's a, it's a condition that's treated in many, many gynecologists miss it. So, so I think absolutely 
when your partner uh, tells you it hurts, women would, would just like to shy away, but really pursuing your partner and saying, look, there's a remedy for this and, and let's do it. Let's go get that fixed is really, really helpful. Um, um, because, and women have this uncanny ability to believe that they don't need sexual intimacy anymore. And it is of many ages, you know, even women in their forties, I'm always shocked by them to say, I really don't need it. I, I don't really like it. Um, and then there's people who just haven't gotten it in so long that when they get it, I, I have a lady who's been hitting her neighbor uh, up, uh, getting a little booty action from the neighbor who is an inappropriate partner, but a lot of fun. And um, she, she recognizes that she's been going after it quite a bit and enjoying it, but her sane self is coming back saying, I really can't keep this going on. Uh, he's not really an appropriate partner for me. And we sort of laugh and say, well, at least you've been having fun. But, um, but you know, even when it's an inappropriate partner, she, her comment to me was, the problem is the switch has been turned on. So now I feel like I'm seeking it. And so for those who have had that in a dating situation, uh, they get it. The switch has been turned on. So now you're just like, oh my gosh, I, I need the next one. Uh, and so that's where she is. So she keeps hitting the wrong guy next door because he's fun, even though she really needs to find a more appropriate level. So, uh, but yes, those are all really common things that come up. BJ, what do you encounter uh, when you're dating uh, uh, with, uh, have you run into any issues with the decision of to have sex or not? Well, yeah. If I, you know, I'm talking about on again, like it's the first one you meet him for drinks or something and you're not even with them two hours and they, you know, they bring up, you know, sex. It's like, that is such a turnoff to me. It's like- Why? You know, what does that mean? When, so when you say it's a turnoff, what is it about their declaration that, I mean, you're beautiful. So clearly they're looking at this beautiful chick sitting across them having coffee and saying, holy smokes, I would, they've already seen you naked in their head three times during that cup of coffee. So they're real, to me, that would be uh, just an embellishment, you know, hey, this guy is really turned on. Now he might be a nutcase, but, um, but he can't help. He's declaring with all honesty, sitting across from you that you really turn him on and hit all of his buttons. So what is it about that? I mean, besides the approach is very direct, which is typical for men. What is it that's so offensive about that to you? When you, what, how do you interpret that? I don't know, you know, I, I guess I've always just tried to get to know a person first and for that to be within the first couple of hours, I don't know, it's kind of intimidating and it's like, I don't want to have anything to do with it. So that's so, the end. That's the see, end. I would, so you're going to miss out on some good ones because <laughs> let me tell so here's the difference between men and women. Men tell it like it is. You know, I think it was Dan who, who jumped on the phone and said, when's the right time to have sex as soon as I can get it. Um, so men are really very direct. If they believe that you are an appropriate partner for them, they're going to let you know they don't dance around it. Women love the dance. They love the emotion. Do, do I even like you enough to get naked for you? You know, and that's the very difference between men and women. We speak a completely different language. I had a, a girl uh, who was anxious to start dating in her 50s. And um, she just was, she loved the email interactions she was having with the guy. And then he sent her uh, a pic of his penis. And she's like, I was, I was talking to this guy and I really thought he was going to be a good guy. And I, I, I was really waiting to move forward with him. And, and then he sent me this and she showed me the picture and I was like, wow, that's nice. And I said, um, and she says, that's disgusting. And I'm like, because he showed you his penis. I said, now that might not be his, just so you know, you might be getting sold a bad bill of goods. Uh, but what he's really trying to communicate with to you is you're getting me so excited. I have this erection and I can think of a few things I'd like to do with it. Um, and she was offended by his, you know, directness of, you know, I've got this boner that I'd like to show you. Um, and so 
trying to get women to understand the language that men speak, which has very few words. It often has a, an erection in it, um, and it, it, you know, because they live. It, sexual intimacy is integral in in life for men. So my oldest uh, patient having intercourse is 93, and her husband is 91, and he still gets a boner. And uh, you know, I said to her the last time she was in you know, he's only staying alive because you still show him your pussy. And she giggled and she was, I know. And I said, you know, if you cut him off, he'd probably die because he's only hanging around to see you naked one more time. And she laughed, you know. Uh, so it's really important for men to have that, but they do not know how to communicate that language that women love of that, you know, niceness. And the men that do know how to do that, are the more estrogenic men, right? Those are those 20% uh, that have the same emotion and will be the same cranky sometimes when they aren't feeling loved or when they're mad at you that they won't be able to perform and you want to have them perform. So I want you to think about men differently and be flattered if someone's sitting in front of you and they're ready to have sex with you at, in two hours be flattered that someone is so turned on by you and don't be offended. Um, and then, you know, I would say something like, slow down, cowboy. I'm not sure I want to see you naked yet. Uh, I, I want to know a little bit more about you. What they're really doing is testing you to say, look, I just was in a 30-year marriage with someone who never showed me anything. I'm not going to do the dance with this girl for two months only to find out she doesn't like sex. So throwing that out there in the beginning and seeing your response will indicate whether you're a sexual being or not. And you don't have to be. So if your goal in the relationship is really long walks on the beach and holding hands, but really never sexual intimacy, it, it's really not an open to that, then I think it's important to declare that right off the bat because most men are out there to hope that at some point uh, sexual intimacy is gonna be there for them. Uh, and understanding that they're direct, you know, I like directness uh, because you never know. I mean, you don't have to worry where they're coming from because you've heard it. You don't have to like it, and you might need to smooth it around a little, you know, you know have them smooth the edges a little bit. But um, I think that guy who is into you in two hours wanted to get your clothes off uh, is just really declaring to you in, in, a, in the wrong language that you didn't want to hear how hot you are. <laughs> <laughs> don't write them off. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I don't know. I know. It, you've been raised a certain way, and you know, you're the nice girl, and it's almost an insult to you that he thinks he can speak to you that way. But men do not go into all that thought and creativeness about that interaction. They're trying to just tell it like it is. Well, and part of that, you know, the couple hours, I've already decided that, yeah, he's not really. For me, not something I'm looking for. So. Okay. Well, that's important. I mean, when you go have coffee with someone, if you just don't feel any vibe, then you know you're absolutely no. So I think there's three piles. The, the one pile is, that's hot, and I think I would like to revisit this guy. There's the, yeah, no. So this is not what I expected. And then and there's a middle pile, like, I don't know. Uh, so there's something that keeps you interested, but not, it's not hitting your normal triggers that you're used to. Um, that's the person that you should visit again, because that probably is the right one. It'll be interesting. <laughs> Guys, am I telling VJ the right thing about how men think about, uh, interacting with women for yeah. the most part? For, yeah. for, certainly for for some if not a lot of men then there's probably other men that may be thinking the same thing but have been taught to filter it better yes without a doubt <laughs> so, without uh, a doubt um yeah definitely when you meet somebody and you seem to be interacting well it goes through your mind, but that doesn't mean anything other than here's somebody that if 
things work out right and stuff like that, uh, you know, you know, maybe we can go somewhere with it, but it's, it's not a, like, certainly I, I know guys who, you know, are okay. We've been, uh, we've been in the restaurant <laughs> for an hour and a half. E either we're going <laughs> home together or I'm never seeing you again. Yeah. No question. There, there are, there are guys like that. Um, there are guys that are so obnoxious when I see them in action, I cringe, <laughs> <laughs> but you know, and, and you know, the, it's a continuum of things. Uh, just a, just an observational experience uh, on the STI trip, the Alaska cruise. Uh, as, as most most of these trips, you know, people interact. We're 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 team. We're being friendly, stuff like that. And there was one of the women who there there were other single people on the ship. And on the particular cruise ship, there's single cabins and all, all the people in the single cabin can go into this lounge that's mm -hmm. only for the people in the single cabins. Oh. It's like you could see that chemistry between this person who, a single guy, but wasn't part of our group and this one woman who was part of our group. And it was interesting just watching the the sort of interaction and stuff like that as the week went on but you know like not being you know like and, and it wasn't just me there there was myself and two other women who all said there's something there <laughs> because that's good so everybody could recognize uh uh the chemistry and right. sometimes it's not that obvious sometimes it's something that develops over time where so that's why i always say in that middle pile of somebody who isn't what you think you are looking for uh, but there's something feature you like give that another shot because people are really nervous in the beginning and they say weird shit and they they act they have little twitches that that just you know where they drink too much because they're a nervous wreck so you try and do those first dates like it's coffee um so Dan or Brad, um, you're sort of sitting there quietly, just absorbing all this. Uh, where where does your single life fit into uh, this discussion? Well, back a long ways. Uh, I, uh, I just, I'm a recent widower. You know, I, for, well, actually, my, two days ago it had been two years since I, I lost my wife. So I'm really not interested right now in uh, finding a relationship. But uh, in line with what Margaret said, I've never, in my younger years, it's a totally different story. But uh, I was in the military. I was in the Air Force for 26 years. And I spent a lot of times in places like Japan, Korea, Okinawa, Thailand, Vietnam, places like that. And uh, finding sex was never a problem. <laughs> you <know>? Yes. <laughs> because I, I was, that, was their, that was their way of life, you know, especially right. the girls right. in the bars, you know. And uh, so I don't know. I was a, I worked as a, a bartender while I was in the military. So that made oh, you got lucky a lot. I, I got <laughs> easy, you know. I, I never really had to uh, pursue, so to say, so much, you know. I mean, I maybe struck up a conversation, but I've never actually, like 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 Mark said, some of these guys that just make idiots out of themselves, you know, trying to impress a woman or a girl, you know. But uh, so that was me. I didn't uh, do it. Uh, I've been married three times. I met all three of my wives in a bar. And I met. I, I, that's that's a reasonable place to meet someone. Don't worry about that. <laughs> yeah. So, well, my first wife, I was in Germany, and she was German. And my second wife, she was a bartender, and I ended up divorced. Well, my first wife divorced me because I was hanging out with my second wife. Oh. Eventually, <laughs> she divorced me, and uh, you know, at my age, I'm 78 years old, and. Uh, the problems that older men encounter have hit me for quite a while, you know. So uh, I'm just, uh, you know. So Brad, know 78 is not old. Uh, uh, do you smoke cigarettes? No, ma'am. Okay. No so um, um, two things about men over really over 50, but definitely over 60, is just like women go through menopause, uh, men go through andropause. 
So their testosterone level drops down as they get older and signs of that would be low energy, low interest in sex, falling to sleep, sleep, sleep quickly after meals, uh, difficulty achieving or maintaining an erection suitable for penetration. Um, and you can restore that uh, with testosterone in a gel or injections um, and not to the level that you had when you were 20, but to the level that uh, is functional, which is about the number of 500. And uh, many men uh, of all ages have found uh, a renewed vitality in life and it makes you healthier from a cardiovascular standpoint. It reduces your chance of diabetes. Um, so uh, a good testosterone level, uh, and it doesn't give you prostate cancer. You know, they used to think that was the case, but then they could not answer the question why most prostate cancer were guys over 70 and they were low T. So anyway, so now that myth has all been dispelled. So, um, you know, you're, you're, you, there is a bounty of women out there in your age group and, and healthy chicks in their 80s that are hungry for companionship. Not all of them want intercourse or sex, but remember that a lot of my patients in their 80s have, um, rather than penetrative intercourse, they have what we call mutual masturbation. And they just get each other off whichever way the person likes it. And there's lots of fun ways. I'm always giving instruction in the office and then I always tell the ladies, don't you tell, tell anybody I said this. And we laugh in there. Usually my staff is knocking on the door trying to get me to come out and stop giggling. But, um, but suffice it to say, there is a market out there of uh, women your age uh, that would be wonderful companions. And even if it's nothing more than a companion because you're not ready to get committed in, into a, a move-in relationship uh, because you're still fresh from the loss of your wife, um, but you, life is only so, so long and, uh, um, and so you have to live it to the fullest. And so um, understanding that and taking a step in the direction of just finding someone to take a walk with. Where do you live? You're, you have a flannel shirt on, so you must be in the cold. I'm in the Atlanta, Georgia area. Oh, okay. And it's been oh. cold here. Yep. 27 degrees, 30 degrees in the morning. 50 degrees. But, but Atlanta, Atlanta is fun. There's a lot of hot women in Atlanta, especially well, in your age group. You know, when I signed up for STI, for the trips and stuff like that, they got these pop-ups. And uh, inadvertently, I mean, I'm what inadvertently, this is women 50 plus in your area. So I thought, let me just check them out. So I clicked it and I never joined anything, match.com or our time or whatever it is, but yet I'm there. You know what I mean? I mean evidently my profile went over. I don't know what happened, but I get emails <laughs> every day from both those agencies of women that, you know, you're your age, blah, 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 you know, and uh, I have never joined it. So I can't message them or do anything and I have no desire to join it right now. But I look at them and I'm thinking, nah, 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 these are not for me. You know, it's just not. You know, maybe I'll see one that look, looks kind of attractive, but she says, uh, well, you know, uh, if you support this politician, don't reply or this or that. <laughs> or, I'm looking for a, a serious relationship. I said, well, that's out, you know, and uh, I, I don't know, you know, so I just, I think that's not for me. My wife, my third wife, all of them are beautiful women, but my third wife was really beautiful and I really, that was my soulmate. And so, you know, I just, I compare everybody to her and uh, nobody can cut a candle, you know. Yeah, you have to resolve that before you start bringing another lady into your life uh, because it is a relationship killer to always go back to that person. Um, it's acceptable in some part of the relationship to, you know, to express where you came from and how you got here. Um, but you're right, until you feel like you've uh, let go. Uh, but you're a good looking dude. So I'm not, uh, I'm not convinced there's not a, a great lady companion up there in Atlanta. Uh, but um, you have to do it at your pace. So I'm glad you're at least just looking. Yeah. It keeps, it well, keeps you know, your my, mind my, busy. My wife uh, passed away with Parkinson's and dementia. And she had, you know, for a lot of years, it just continuously degrades and degrades. And then, uh, you know, years, a couple of years or so, for uh, what you can still communicate real well and stuff like that. She says, you know, when she says, when I die, I don't want another woman in this bed. And I said, there will never be another woman in this bed. 
you know, and so I'm holding true to that. I mean, if I do have a relationship, it's going to be at her house or a hotel. I was going to say, or get another bed. <laughs> get a new bed. I have three beds in the house, but I, you know, it's, it's, yeah. it's, if it's in the house, it's in the bed. You know, so so I'm that, just saying, I um, that, that is an unfair statement for a dying spouse to do. Uh, no. you, you should, yeah. Uh, uh. But you, that, that was, the, uh, it's good that you feel committed to her. That's awesome. So Dan. What's your experience been with women? What's it been with women? No, Dan, I was asking Dan. Oh, I'm sorry. What, what, what he's, uh, how he's run into, what his crazy things are that he's run into with ladies. I don't, I haven't run into crazy things. Uh, I mean, I, I've never been with someone that I ended up thinking that she was bizarre. Or anything like that. They, I tend to be uh, attracted to people who, who have common sense. <laughs> that's that's something that's important to me. Good start. And uh, I haven't been doing a lot of dating for some time. It, it feels like work. It feels like work, and uh, it is work. It's a, it's like a job resume. It's you're 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 looking through somebody's resume and trying to figure out how they fit in for the job that you have at hand. Yeah, I mean, with the pandemic, it's a little bit more challenging, also. So um, you know, my typical day, I I work on the computer. In the afternoon, I'll go for a walk. It ends up at the dog park and um, come back home and get back on the computer, watch some TV. Well, uh, hopefully when COVID ends, you'll be able to get out there and exercise some of your skills. And who knows, maybe in the next time we meet, we'll talk about another topic that will expand that, that repertoire of what you want to know or how to manage uh, that next relationship that you may encounter. Tell me more about that. About what? What you just said. I, I... Well, so basically, we're going to do a series of conversations about sex. We'll title them all a little differently and go in some different directions, but always realize that regardless of the topic of the day, I'm open to uh, answering any questions about um uh, any sexual concerns or questions in general about relationships that you may have, if I know the answer. Uh, so I, I know we have another one planned in January. So you just reminded me of something. Okay. Uh, I think that intelligence is sexy. Oh yes, I do too. I agree with that. Although it is sort of fun to hit up the construction worker periodically. Well, or the, yeah, or the nurse saying. or the flight attendant. <laughs> uh, exactly. I mean, I, I could be talking to someone that I think is uh, okay looking. And then as I get to know her, she becomes increasingly appealing, you know, the more attractive. That's true. I, I wanted to um, add a piece when you were talking about the free buckets and that middle person that you might, you know, one of the things I think is a, is a disservice to all human beings is I like the online dating serves a purpose, but um, we're, we judge so quickly and um, you know, VJ gets attention. She looks nice. I get attention, but I know there's a lot of people out there that don't get attention and they're so defeated because they try to do the online thing and they just don't get noticed. And that's a shame because what Dan is saying is when you have some time to spend with people, um, they really get to know them, even though they're sexual urges for sure. Um, you alluded very early in the call about waiting for, you know, at least six to a year and a half um, so that you really get to know somebody, but you can fall in love with somebody that you didn't have an initial urge about because you really got to know that person. So I, that's been my, um, my flag for many, many years. Um, and I'm not really putting a pitch in here, but one of the things I like about a vacation is that you do get to see people 
for an extended period of time versus like a three minute dating. You get to see them under pressure. You get to see them outside of their um, normal environment. So you learn a lot about somebody um, when you're on a trip with them um, and, it, and you get a chance to, to, you know, get to know that person a little bit better than, you know, just picking up someone in a bar, which is great too. Done, done them both. So I, I, I promote it all. <laughs> I agree 100% in that uh, giving it time and the, and the judging of, of first things. Um, I, when my office manager was single, she, you know, she would quickly get frustrated on the first, you know, she'd have all these guys, like I would always go in and refresh her pictures. I would take the pictures of her headshots, you know, show that she had fake boobs in case they didn't like fake boobs, showed she had a tattoo in case they didn't like tattoos, showed her in an evening gown, showed her in swimwear. I mean, they had to know what they were getting uh, with the pictures and they were all date and time stamps. So they knew they were fresh, um, but she would quickly get frustrated because that's her personality. She judges so quickly and I would go in there. So I became the scribe and I would say, just move over here. Let me, this is how I would answer this guy. And, you know, I would type away and pretend I was Judy and, uh, uh, and it would go back and forth. And then I'd line her up for a, a meeting at Starbucks and she'd go at like a 5 p.m. Starbucks uh, coffee date. And one week I had her like on a Wednesday, Thursday, Friday and Saturday, four different dates. It just was a busy week for her. And she says, I felt like the Starbucks hooker. I was in there every night with a new guy. And then I walked out the door and it was the same Starbucks. She always went to the one by her house. But the one thing I put her to task to try and get her to stop judging was, let's just pretend like we're doing research, like we're doing a study on human behavior. And we kept a binder. And you know, when so she was on the, the dating site of the person that she was interacting with, she would print something that had his like name and picture on it and we keep it in a binder. And then when she went on the date, she would write comments about it like, he had dirty fingernails or he rode a nice motorcycle to the date or he texted someone too much during the date, whatever. And she would keep notes. And then we'd sit there in the morning and carry on and laugh. And, and sometimes we would pick the dates for her. Like, well, why don't you try this one? Uh, because sometimes people get into a rut of picking what they always liked, but Judy had four husbands. And so guess what? She made that same mistake four times. We're thinking she needed a different direction. And so trying to get her away from what she thought she liked, which clearly was not always the best for her. Um, and by making it a project and research, you sort of sat back and listened a little bit better uh, when you were guiding the research. And it got her uh, a better choice of partners and and, uh, and she's done well with that. So, uh, so I, I agree with Tammy. It's people get very nervous about the whole situation and interacting. And so trying to just keep it light and just make it, you know, like another day um, will, will help. But at least you have some background today of if you find somebody, um, maybe the first couple steps on what to do in the event that you start thinking about sex. But as VJ has let you know loud and clear, uh, don't let them, don't let the woman know on the first date because that may be a turnoff. <laughs> don't let the woman know what? Uh, don't that you, like, she was telling us that, you know, she met a guy and like within two hours, he was like telling her how sexy she was or that he wanted to have sex. And she was very put off by that. Was so, he really that direct, VJ? Yeah. yeah. Well, that was inappropriate. I agree. <laughs> well, so, listen, I'm a big so proponent VJ, of... VJ, now that I've agreed with you that his behavior was inappropriate, do you want to have sex? <laughs> <laughs> no. <laughs> we all so, learned a little something. I think clear is kind. That's a saying that I heard recently, uh, you know, in the last year from a coach in a business perspective and clear is kind, right? And there's no better time to be clear in the beginning because there's nothing at risk, right? So you're able to have conversations as Dr. Whalahan said, make it an investigative or a, like a study, like ask questions, be curious, um, 
practice saying something that you never dreamed you were able to say, and you're know, like, oh my God, I'd be embarrassed if I said that. But ask the questions because there's nothing worse than we've all been married and divorced. And uh, there's nothing worse than wasting, you know, four, five, six, 10, 12 years on somebody when you really have a chance to ask questions and learn about that person in the beginning. So Dr. Whalahan, thank you so much for today. My pleasure. This was great. <laughs> I feel like you really captured everybody's interest. I mean, this is, I think, a record for us here at, at, at SLT. Now we have SLT, which is short for slut. And I'm sorry that I'm naming all my <laughs> so companies. You have, you have SLTs and STIs. I was like, wow. <laughs> I but know. Maybe you get a lot of attention on the STI. <laughs> that could work for you. Oh my gosh. And it's a subliminal and subconscious, but um, we look forward to the next event with you guys in January. Uh, we'll have Dr. Whalahan back and um, maybe we'll start a group because uh, we have uh, special interest groups. Maybe we'll start a special interest group on um, healthy sexual relationships and you guys can put your, your questions in there so that when, before we meet. Yes, that would be helpful because there are people that prefer not to ask questions. So I did this, uh, 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 lecture to the women of Hadassah. And, and so in South Florida, large Jewish populations down here, but the Hadassah ladies are very ladylike. And I was supposed to talk to them about sex and hormones. And so that, you know, usually in an audience, there's always questions. And at the end of this, not a peep. One lady did answer, ask a question about hot flashes. Uh, but the minute I left the building and got out to my car, I was absconded by numerous women who wanted to tell me their sexy stories and asked me the questions because they were very private and their girlfriends did not know about all the fun sex they have. So um, having a little question area where uh, questions or just topics can be mentioned so that they're anonymous, I think would be terrific. And it's a great great way to get information out that maybe I forget to talk about because I talk about this all the time. Great. No, it was, it was fascinating. Did you guys enjoy today's event with Dr. Yeah. Willihan? Yeah. Thank you for yeah. joining. Thank you. Uh, I look Thank forward you. to speaking to you all again and uh, 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 we'll meet in January. Great. Okay. Okay. Awesome. Kelly. Kelly. Yeah. Do, are we going to do the uh... yes mark mark i'm going to email you i'm going to end this meeting and then um let this go and then i'll i'll shoot you a quick email with a new zoom link is that okay that's cool <laughs> thank you so much all right guys all right thanks day. guys yeah. everyone have, have an fun. awesome day bye bye, bye.